all is about are we protecting water quality? Um, and our uh, lead for this panel is Dr. Laura Johnson, who's standing to my right here. I'm going to read her bio, and then she's going to take over and read the bios for the other two panelists. Uh, so Laura is director of the National Center for Water Quality Research at Heidelberg University in Tiffin, Ohio. And at that center, uh, long-term monitoring of streams and rivers is used to examine the influence of human activities on water quality and help decide actions that lead to healthier ecosystems. Uh, Laura is best known for research examining the linkages between agricultural runoff and harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie. And Laura, would you rather stand up here or use this mic? Yeah, okay. All right, hi everyone. So we're missing a panel member, and so what I'm going to do is probably just stand in for Dan, not pretend to be Dan, but then just take over as a, from my perspective, and I hope you don't mind us doing that. Um, so what I wanted to do first is um, introduce our other two panel members here, give them an opportunity to just say a little bit about what they're working on that's relevant to our question here, which is really about protecting our waters, you know, what is the health of some of our aquatic ecosystems, and, and ultimately we're hoping to have a nice discussion with everyone here about what our biggest threats are to these aquatic ecosystems. I am going to let, because Jim is closer to me, so I'm gonna introduce Jim first. And I don't think he needs any introductions because he is the director of the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance and he did just introduce all of you to this conference. What you may not know is that he's also, uh, hopefully you do know, but maybe you don't, he's also director of the Flathead Biological Station, which is affiliated with the University of Montana. And I've known Jim um, previously in my, you know, student life because he uh, co-wrote a book on ecological stoichiometry. So he's got this deep invested interest in nitrogen and phosphorus as key limiting nutrients to, to lakes. So Jim, if you want to go on and say a few words about what you are working on that is relevant to the health of our ecosystems here. All right, well, everyone I think knows that I'm, <laughs> I, 10 years ago or so, I started uh, this organization called Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance, which is an outgrowth of the a research coordination network on uh, phosphorus sustainability that we ran for several years. Um, putting a lot of time into that and, and bringing, um, a, from my own experience, a different perspective, because I'm mostly a water person and learning much more about agriculture, food production, the food system, mining, uh, fertilizer production and all those dimensions has been um, pretty interesting and it brought me into domains of sustainability science and other sorts of um, approaches and perspectives um, which is a natural thing being from Arizona at that time and still at Arizona State University where that's a big uh, theme. So um, phosphorus, so I've always considered phosphorus from the perspective of the water and um, but this more last 10 years I've been looking into the watershed and the, all the activities taking place there. Um, that's on the one hand, the more obvious connection to what we're talking about today. But as was as Laura mentioned, I'm director of the Flathead Lake Biological Station at the University of Montana. And Flathead Lake, if you don't know it, is uh, the largest freshwater lake in the western United States. Um, very beautiful lake, very clear water. And we just published 40 years of nitrogen and phosphorus data for the lake. It's going back to the uh, early 80s or so. Um, and showed that phosphorus loading to that lake has declined by 10% over that period. Um, pretty amazing, actually, and the water quality of that lake is stunning. Um, and um, it's a great success story. It's a, it's a story of um, successful um, implementation of wastewater treatment technologies, essentially, as the urban, uh, well, as the human population increased in the watershed, uh, phosphorus loading has not increased, and that's because um, wastewater treatment, uh, rigorous wastewater treatment was implemented at early stage. And so I think, you know, that's on the good news side of the ledger. We have, uh, we have lakes, uh, various places going the other direction. So I'm very interested in preserving the endangered um, oligotrophic lakes of the world. Um, and, um, and therefore you have to go where the phosphorus um, is and the phosphorus that's moving in the food system in the world right now is driven entirely by human activity, not entirely, but largely by human activity. And so um, 
So that's called my attention to all these complex interactions between society um, and uh, the drivers of food and water um, uh, at the larger scale. So that's a little bit from my side. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. And then we also have Joanne Burkholder. Now, um, probably most people think of Joanne as the person who helped determine why we had you know, these fish kills that were occurring on the coast of North Carolina and linking them to Fisteria and then why is Fisteria happening and that sort of thing. But she also has co-authored or authored over 200 peer review publications emphasizing culture eutrophication and aquatic ecosystems. So she thinks more broad scape than just the Neuse River and Neuse River Estuary. Um, she is the William Neal Reynolds Distinguished Professor. She's also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science or AAAS. Um, and because of all of her work, she's received numerous awards, and she's also have been invited to testify before Congress on issues that involve nutrient pollution and harmful algae. Um, so clearly thinks a lot about the health of our aquatic ecosystems. And so Joanne, I invite you to talk a little bit about what you've been doing lately um, and what you think about the, how we're protecting our waters. Thank you. Um, can you hear me with this mic, or should I? It sounds good. Okay, sounds good. great. Um, colleagues and I just completed 20, almost 30 years of long-term research and monitoring on a major estuary, and uh, more than 15 years of research and monitoring on several potable source water reservoirs that serve as the drinking water supply for about 750,000 people. In that effort, we've tracked phosphorus and nitrogen, the second key nutrient um, that we've worked with. And we've tracked these changes over time. We've also tracked associated pollutants and ecosystem response and the efficacy of management actions. And it's in our work, we, we really appreciate what Jim Elzer has done with ecological stoichiometry because our work and many other folks have substantiated that, that it, it really requires co-management of both phosphorus and nitrogen to control algal biomass, algal blooms, and also the quality of the algae at the base of the food web. The other major component that I've spent a lot of time in my life on is helping concerned citizens groups on nutrient pollution issues and impacts. And my work in the past decade or two has taken me to the northwest of the United States and also the, the entire Mississippi Basin, the southeast. And unfortunately, what we've seen from our research is that many ecosystems, many surface waters in this nation anyway, are really becoming increasingly degraded from nutrient pollution. The work I've done with concerned citizens groups has, has included commenting on major sewage treatment plant permits for municipal sewage. I've worked quite a bit with confined animal feed operations and appreciate some of the questions and comments, thank you, <laughs> that you've made about that issue. Um, if you go just a little bit down east from where we are right now, you run into the most concentrated um, swine operations and swine per unit area in the world. And there are also major poultry operations that are not nearly as well regulated in this state. So between sewage and swine CAFOs, um, we've seen quite a bit of degradation of surface waters in this country. Uh, one of the other things I've worked on with concerned citizens groups is helping to describe and define um, numeric standards for phosphorus in surface waters. And in this nation, we don't have much by way of, of total nitrogen numeric or quantitative standards. And only a few states have what I consider effective phosphorus criteria, numeric phosphorus criteria. So I've, I've tried to help concerned citizens groups push for those sorts of things because numeric or quantitative standards are so much more protective than the narrative standards that most states have. Um, I'm not sure you folks might be aware of narrative standards, but just to give you an example, Illinois says that Phosphorus is okay if there is no unsightly algal growth and um, 
if there's no unnatural plant and algal biomass. If you were a state agency person, would you be able to enforce something like that? So we really need quantitative numeric criteria for nutrients. And um, right now, the only state that has both nitrogen and phosphorus criteria is Hawaii. So, so we have a long way to go. Overall, my research and my work at the Science Policy Interface has really supporting the, the, the major need for many surface waters in this country, at least, um, for better nitrogen and phosphorus controls and much better protection from this kind of pollution. Right now, this kind of pollution in our country is increasing. Jim mentioned in his first talk that um, there was good news through the turn of this century that in, in soup, because of sewage controls, because of removal of phosphorus from detergent bans, the conditions of surface waters from nutrient pollution in this country seem to be improving, at least through 2000. But EPA in 2003, for the first time, said that um, for the first time in 30 years, our waters were degrading from raw sewage. So I'll come back to that later on, I think, in this panel. But even in, this, in, in the, the realm of point sources, um, I think Flathead Lake is, is, is very much worth protecting. It's, it's definitely an endangered species because so many waters in this country are, are really degrading from nutrient pollution. And so I'm, I'm at, on the receiving end. I usually work in pollution assessment of that sort. Why don't, why don't you give us your perspective, Laura, from your recent experiences, since now you're a member of the panel. I need to turn this on. Oh, no, it's on and ready. Awesome. I just thought it would be better to be here and make us all have a trifecta, right? Three is the magic number. Um, anyway, so yeah, so what we work on at the National Center for Water Quality Re Research, uh, Matt described fairly well. We've been doing long-term monitoring of streams and rivers and watersheds all around Ohio and focused around Lake Erie. We do high quality or high frequency monitoring, have been doing so for over 46 years, so three times a day sampling with the sole purpose to understand non-point sources of pollution. We really want to understand that land runoff component. We have a lot of um, you know, agriculture in our watersheds, and so that's really important for assessing both what those nutrient loads are and how they change over time. Um, what we found in the major highly agricultural Lake Erie watersheds is that one form of phosphorus increased from the mid-90s through the early 2000s, and that was dissolved phosphorus, where we've seen decreases in particulates. And a lot of times when we think about these nutrient criteria that have been set, they're usually focused on total phosphorus or total nitrogen, and it's just lucky that we happen to be measuring dissolved phosphorus as well, because we could. And then and we we're breaking a lot of EPA rules on handling. We just do what we want, right? A little bit rogue over there. And, um, and from that, we were able to better understand the causes of, of eutrophication in Lake Erie. Um, and that increase in dissolved phosphorus doesn't make sense with some of the data that we see from agricultural lands. Less phosphorus being applied, more fields are in a negative crop balance. Why are we seeing these big losses and why are they causing such big blooms? And it seems to be really largely associated with fertilizer placement. So we get into all of these very minute details of agricultural management. Sorry, I'm winging this a bit because I wasn't prepared to have to answer the questions, <laughs> but nonetheless, here we go. So when I think about what we're doing and what we do that's related to this, we think about all the sources of, of runoff and um, Lake Erie, the point sources have decreased and are much lower, but we also work in a lot of tributaries that are in the southern part of Ohio that ultimately lead to the Ohio River and the Mississippi River based on where it's a totally different picture. So um, I, I feel like we see some of the same things that Joanne has been talking about. So with that, um, you guys should all be thinking of questions, right? We're, at, we're trying to understand how, go ahead. Question. Phil has Phil has one already. Oh, all right, <laughs> Phil, go right ahead. I was going to feed us one question while you thought, but you're a fast thinker. It's hard to hold Phil back. No, I can no, tell go you right ahead. Right Let's go, Phil. So, th thank you very much. So, um, I, I mean, I, in this debate and in this topic, I, I cannot help. You know, what I think of uh, is uh, you're all making very elegant points, but it strikes me that your points are very, very kind of 
um, zoomed in on the detail and the locality, which is, of course, understandable and, and, and respectable. But, but, I, but I, you know, I just think we need to remember. Let's just, just zoom out for a minute, right? So here we are. It's 2022. 70, 80 years ago since we really started, uh, uh, you know, increasing the earth cycle of this, uh, of this element, uh, you know, and, and started really spreading it around at least half of the world at least. So it's only a few decades in a four and a half billion year old Earth that we started doing this. And, um, and therefore, you know, we've seen amazing benefits from this, but we're now start, you know, we're seeing some disbenefits. And it's just about, I guess my point is temporal uh, and time frame perspective. And, you know, uh, let, you know, let's think about what's happened over the last few decades and what's going to carry on probably happening for at least the last few decades and I'm going to put to you, put to the room that we're at a really critical turning point now in 2022 about whether we reverse uh, or we, we just go too far down the road. Uh, we might already be too far down the road. So it's a question of perspective and time frame, really, about the water quality impacts. Can we really expect to change if we, we're doing what we've been doing? I hope that just helps the discussion move along. All right, so I heard the question is, can we really expect to change if we keep doing what we're doing, which, you know, kind of gets into, you know, what, how do we better, are we sustaining our waters appropriately and how do we do that better? And I will feed it over to my other panel members to start. I really appreciated Jonathan's talk, um, especially when I saw his first graph and looked at the green bars the little tiny, eensy weensy green bars <laughs> compared to everything else on that slide. And I thought about the, the comment in, in a different way, but I think fairly similar in some respects, because how the, the real question boils down to water pollution is largely out of sight, out of mind for most people. They don't understand it. And things look pretty good um, to a lot of folks, even when systems are deteriorating, as we've seen so many of them do. It, it really kind of is mind-boggling to me, so I didn't ask him about this, but I think that the real need is to try to change the educational mindset of the legislatures that we have, our governments, as well as the grassroots people, because not only do, do common folk not understand, our governments don't understand very well in these issues, and um, if we can't change the mindset, I, I'm kind of, I'm almost kind of depressed to, to as much as I am I'm happy about the, the climate change emphasis of Congress, because I don't want Congress to turn around and say, there, you've got enough now. <laughs> and that's what I think a danger is of doing. So if we can't really increase politically astute environmental education in this country, I think we're we're not going to be able to turn this around. So I hope we can. No, I don't. Uh, as usual, I don't quite know how to respond to your to your provocative ideas, um, which is why we this is Phil wrote our phosphorus book together. So we had a lot of conversations like this. Um, you know, well, I think what you're referring to is just if we look historically, geologically speaking, there's going to be this square wave in the phosphorus history of Earth, right, where everything was sort of, nat you know, going along a natural weathering for a while. And then in the matter of a blink of an eye, we ma mobilize massive amounts of phosphorus that had been stored over millions of years. And I think your point is, could we expect anything else than what we're seeing, given that we've done that? Um, and I... You're probably right. I mean, it's hard to imagine how you could mobilize such a critically important nutrient without seeing massive input. The question then becomes, is there anything we can do about it? And I would say, yeah, I think so. I think we know how to proceed, at least in, in, in many ways, to keep phosphorus where it belongs inside the food system. But we need to go faster, just as fast as we mobilize it. We need to figure out a better way to um, retain and recycle it um, within the food system. And then the only thing I wanted to add, that was kind of where my brain was going too, Jim. I was thinking more in the time lag issue. You know, it's like, if you look back in different examples in history, I think that we could find place times where, um, maybe little blinks of time, where we could actually sustainably have food and clean water, and then it kind of ebbs and flows. And 
Um, I think that we could argue as to why those ebbs and flows are actually happening. But you know, right now I'm sort of stuck in this world of how long is it gonna take? We're doing all of this stuff, we're investing so much money and we're doing what we think is the right thing. How long is it gonna take? And so one of, I think, our biggest uh, challenges in thinking of future sustainability and what's gonna happen is the time lag that it takes between making an action on the ground and how long it takes to see it in the water. And how many people do we need to have take that action on the ground before we start to see it? And so in some actions I can say, I don't know the answer to what you're asking, Phil, because we're doing so much right now that we haven't seen have an effect in the water yet. And I, it's hard to know the, the relative magnitude of how effective those practices are going to be, especially when we're talking about, and you know, I feel like I know that I am very place-based and we have very unique perspectives and unique issues. So I'm thinking on a larger scale, each place has probably got its own unique issues and each one's gonna have its own relative time lags and understanding how effective those practices are gonna be are, are challenging. Phil has a follow-up. Phil, would you like to join us up here? <laughs> well, uh, probably I can help from here. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I just, I mean, I don't wanna take over, but I just got another thing back at you whilst, you know, to help things move along. So. I was thinking, I'll just give you a story which is relevant to this discussion, which which was which you provoked me on there. I was flying in last night, and I was in a big long line at JFK Airport to connect down here. And I was in this long line, and I got talking to this guy behind me, and he saw that I had this phosphorus bag with me, and he started asking me about what I do. And I tried to explain to him. And it turns out this guy was from, uh, he, he's from Florida, and he worked in the oil industry. And he just got right on at me about climate change. And we and I was just, whoa, he was like, like was pinning me down. You know, he obviously just was really angry um, about environment issues. And, uh, and you know, and, and he saw phosphorus as a kind of the same thing. And he was just on at me and pinning me. He was a smart guy. We had a kind of respectable debate, but it was just really quite shocking, really, um, the level of, well, I suppose it sounds patronizing, but ignorance really in the, in the, in the, in, from a smart guy, but he was feeling threatened really. But I think my point is, I mean, that's just a story, but my point is if we are going to make a difference here, we are so down the line, we are so second fiddle to carbon and climate change and those things, we are so buried in the story. We've just got to do so much better at getting our story out there. It's so difficult. I'm not knocking any of the efforts that people are doing, but we are still, we're just... It, you know, I'm just saying we've got to move it forward, and it's really difficult when even the prominent things like carbon are still not creating it, you know enough traction with a lot of people. So just write a book, Phil. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that the point that I would make with that that comment, Phil, because we're, I see that a lot too, and we've been working on a project where we're trying to develop a you know market-based approach to phosphorus, um, like BMPs to reduce phosphorus, right? Um, this is uh, a project we have going on, and some of our biggest co-partners right now have been people that are developing these carbon markets, which would be, you know, probably supported through the Farm Bill, ultimately, um, because it's talking about putting in cover crops. And so, of course, I gave the presentation that I give often about how cover crops might not actually help phosphorus very much, um, and then threw them all off a little bit. But I think the point being that there could be a way to, if, if we were smart about our messaging that we there could be a way to put those programs together and if you already have a carbon market how can we also have a nitrogen and phosphorus market associated with it to help get the people the farmers and producers that don't want to be implementing practices especially through government programs any longer how do we get them involved in doing you know more holistic farm management that could help more than just one thing and i think that's the the challenge that we're seeing overall in one way so I do have a long list of questions here. Did you have a question real quick? Yeah. Since you, Jim, had this success story from your region, what, what, what is the difference between these failures and your success story? Can you ex explain a little uh, bit? Great question. So the question, yeah, so what is the, behind the story of uh, Flathead Lake's success? Well, first of all, you should get 80% of your watershed designated as a federal wilderness area or national park. <laughs> So that's what happened to Western Montana um, in the early part of the 20th century. And um, 
it's a beautiful area and it's very unpopulated. So, you know, it's, you know, I wish I could say it was easy and that's gonna happen everywhere. It cannot happen everywhere, right? That's what happened there as step one. But then, you know, I do think the lake would be much worse condition and it was given a TEMDL as a numerical standard um, in the early 80s and late 70s when algal blooms were starting to pop up. Luckily, and I, the previous uh, folks who ran the biological station implemented the first tertiary advanced wastewater treatment uh, plant in the basin at the field station to demonstrate low nutrient removal to low levels. And that was adopted in, in the three or four uh, towns uh, in the watershed. And so while the watershed has increased its population by more than twofold in that period, nutrient loading for the lake has gone down. And, and we have good data coming out of those wastewater plants that show that phosphorus removal has been very effective. Nitrogen removal, not, because they don't do it. Uh, but phosphorus removal, uh, yeah, they're very, very effective. And so um, why was it? Uh, yeah, and also a phosphate detergent ban was implemented at the watershed scale at that time. I think that the biological station at that time, and hopefully we still do have a good relationship with the citizens in the catchment, and they see very clearly the lake. The lake is the focus of that whole um, community around that lake, and they appreciate how valuable it is. And so they're readily able to um, accept um, the, and implement the recommendations. So again, maybe it's a disconnect. It's as Joanne was saying, there's a disconnect between practices here and impacts there, right? We don't, it's hard to make those connections. And when Nancy Rabelais is here, we're talking about the whole watershed of the Mississippi River, in the Gulf of Mexico, you don't think about the Mississippi River when you're in Nebraska, for example, right? It's just something that's distant and far away and not connected to your 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 day-to-day -day well-being. So in Planet Lake, it's all that area. It is the lake, and people learned quickly and were uh, receptive to the message that nutrient management was essential. And I still, every time I speak of, to the public there, I'm always also congratulating the community on the good decisions they made 30, 40 years ago. And if I could have a follow-up for, for Joanne, you know, I know that you've been looking a lot at wastewater reductions and, and that sort of thing. Why aren't tertiary treatments at every plant in the United States, like, what are the challenges associated with, with getting better, um, better reductions from point sources, in your opinion? Uh, I think both of those questions are really good. And when Jim mentioned tertiary treatment, and now you are as well, um, tertiary treatment means different things to different people. When I was talking to Jim earlier, he said that tertiary treatment in Montana meant 90% phosphorus removal. In North Carolina, tertiary treatment means bubble the effluent to increase the oxygen and temporarily and convert the ammonia to nitrate remove a few suspended solids and call it a day. I was shocked by that because that sounds like primary, maybe secondary treatment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we have tertiary treatment, but no thanks. What we should have instead is biological nutrient removal. Yeah. And, and um, BNR, biological nutrient removal, pays for itself within about 10 years. It's been around since the 1970s. It's just that cities don't have the funding for the upfront costs. And the 1970s, uh, again, Jonathan's talk was terrific in laying out the history. In the 1970s, there was major influx, at least in this nation, um, for sewage treatment. And many cities, for the first time, got a sewage treatment plant. The country didn't even have much sewage treatment until then. And then President Reagan gutted that funding. So now many of the sewage treatment plants in this country are antiquated. They don't have much federal funding influx so that if cities want to improve, they really can't find the funding to do it. And so they can't afford the upfront costs. We have success stories and I think BNR is a great success story. First, let me tell you that we have about 4,500 major sewage treatment plants in this country that discharge um, one million gallons per day. I'm an American, I'm terrible about metrics. <laughs> so, sorry about that. But in any case, um, of that 4,500 plants, 5% have controls on nitrogen and phosphorus. 9% have controls on phosphorus. 
most sewage treatment in this country is secondary, removes about half of the sewage, of the phosphorus and nitrogen, which is 10 to 100 times more than is needed to fuel noxious algal blooms. So we really need BNR. BNR is a major success story in Sacramento, California, where California has a, a great system of providing funding to cities who want to improve. And Sacramento just got a great BNR plant, which is really reducing the ammonia in, that, in their sewage. It's helping to improve the, the whole Delta ecosystem and the water's being reused in a state that really needs water. So there's all kinds of success stories we could talk about. The, the problem, in my opinion, goes back to the, the, the trite but extremely compelling need for politically astute education so that the public and legislatures want to do what's needed. And Jackson, Mississippi might be a really great oh. example of all of that whole mess. I think there's a question over here. Start working. Yeah, okay. So just to build on a couple of these, all the way back to Phil, the other panel member that's disappeared here. So <laughs> most people have probably, I'm guessing, a fair number of people have read Jeffrey Sachs' book, Commonwealth, right, about the, the economic argument for investment in our environment. So if we touch on all of these subjects from BNR, 100% agreed, I'm writing a paper on that now. Jim knows my beliefs on a lot of this stuff. So my question is, how as a group, especially our astute leaders up here, how do we close the loop on this discussion to make policy decision makers aware of the economic impacts of, of the environmental challenge that we're talking about here? And you, you talked about property values around Lake Erie in one of the slides here, right? So there seems to be touching on it but sometimes it seems like we get lost in the science, in the details of the quantitative arguments of river stream ecology, but we have to find a way to connect it back to an audience, such as the guy in the airport line, so that they understand what the impact on his life is relative to the policy decision makers at the highest level. So how do we do that? <laughs> we need more, I'm looking, we I'm need looking, more of that. I, I, really, am, I am looking I, at you, Jim. Yes, yes, I absolutely. really think that, that the, the, the only thing I've seen that has worked with, for instance, industrialized animal agriculture has been to, to show them where profits would be. And the huge, a huge area that I think would be so helpful is to get them to, to really invest in removing phosphorus and nitrogen from manure. We have mountains of manure in the state. Um, down east in, in our state, with a water table that's only a meter thick, a meter of soil over the water table to absorb the waste, we have more than, than all the human waste worth of California, New York, and other states in combination on that fragile coastal plain. If we, we could get agriculture folks to invest in ways to make money from recovering phosphorus and nitrogen from manure, that would help. And I, I think I'm saying that in part because of the methane story. Um, agriculture, in, in my state anyway, um, industrialized animal agriculture was not interested in, in, in um, imposing better cleanup methods. And then they found out that they could recover methane and it might give them more economic um, profit. So they began to get very interested in it. So I, th I think we have opportunities to do that, but I really think we have to convince them that there's a, there's a lot of reason that will help them to do it. Not, not, not altruism as much as, as economic sense. I do think we need more environmental economics on these types of issues where you actually have that whole full loop. Because if you, know, if you go and you talk to anyone um, industry that's dealing with these issues, they can't see beyond that. So right now, the, the practices that we would need to actually fix Lake Erie, they, they were talking about, you know, less than 1% of the phosphorus that's being applied is being lost. So why would a farmer care about that tiny little percent, you know, when they're doing, you know, pretty good for the, the remaining 99% of their phosphorus they're applying? So you have to say, okay, of this tiny amount, 
it goes downstream and causes these property value issues and it costs Toledo $10,000 a day to filter out toxins from their drinking water, you know, to, to get it, a, you know, um, at a low enough level for human consumption or, you know, the, the other tourism impacts that come from that. I don't know whose fault this is, but he's got it. So none, I talk loud, I'm sorry. Uh, but nonetheless, so I don't think I've seen very often people put all of those perspectives together into one place. Um, and I do think that is a huge need and that would certainly help. But then when you go and you, even if you take that, if you take these big scary numbers like property values, and then you look at the entire sort of, you know, the economics associated with agriculture, say in Ohio, then, you know, then it starts to pale in a different way. And so when you, we have to put all of that together, I think, to make those types of changes. And that's where it gets challenging. On the point source side, I think it's the same sort of thing. You do an, 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 some sort of an increase. Now, what's the first thing that anyone does? They say, well, this is going to increase this person's water bill by this much, because who pays for that, that technological improvement? Why do we not get that? It's because then now this, the water, you know, the cleanup from sewage is just too expensive for the general citizen. And so how do we make that into a better perspective? Um, I've heard arguments that some of the things in the Farm Bill, like crop insurance programs, make it especially difficult to put in better conservation practices because they don't have to do it if they have insurance that they're not going to lose yield. You know, there's like little things, I think, that we really need um, folks to delve into in more detail. I, I'm not that person, unfortunately, but, you know, I would love to talk to someone who is that person to make sure they get all the science part right so we can answer those big questions. I would just say, Matt, um, I guess, we, who's the Jane Goodall of, of nutrient management? I don't know. I mean, we need <laughs> someone needs to make a movie out of Phil and I's book or something. I don't know what it's going to take, right, um, to bring, bring things a little higher yeah. in prominence. Um, you know, we're sitting here talking about excrement and manure, right? It's a hard topic, right, to get a lot of, you know, popular buy-in on, right? It's a challenging thing. On the other hand, um, maybe we can think about places where humanity has been successful in solving problems. The best example, I think, is uh, ozone hole and CFC mitigation. That worked. That was a success story. So then we can look back at the, what are the lessons there. Well, the lessons are not that helpful, right, because very narrow industry sector, very specific problem, right? And so it was very easy to sort of hone in with a, sub a substitutable technology, right? So that one is encouraging. That shows that humanity can solve large, large problems. But um, this case of the food, whole food water system, the whole way that we sustain ourselves has to be shifting. And it can't shift in ways, I think, that are just sort of um, Let's continue what we're doing, but better, right? That's sort of fixing things on the edges. It seems like we need more systemic level things that will happen, transformative, disruptive, is to use a term of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe those disruptive innovations come about because of some large scale innovation like huge influx of funds um, associated with uh, farming um, to get to scale. Um, but that's what it's going to take. But it's a, there's a lot of moving parts. You know, if you look at the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance flyer, sort of forecasting out to the future, right? If you want to get to a sustain, more sustainable phosphorus system, you need some of this, you need some of that, you need some of this and a little more of that, right? It's not quite as easy an intervention. Um, but yeah, more charisma among leadership would be great to get the message out. <laughs> Good. So um, we've talked a lot about various sort of tidbits here and there. I'm wondering if we want to briefly touch on, you know, what are, you know, what what are the biggest current threats? What do you think is the, if you could pick one, one biggest current threat to our the health of our aquatic ecosystem, or future threat? You go either one you want. You can. They sometimes say the same. Which one, what would you pick? What do you think is the biggest current threat to the health of our aquatic ecosystems and their sustainability? I may have shown it. Maybe this goes back to Phil as well. And, um, you know, we put a huge amount of phosphorus out into the system, right? And uh, that used to be buried. It's been buried for millions of years. And we brought it into circulation. 
into soil, into sediments, into water, and it's moving around. And what's happening in the next several decades are the climatic events that we talked about, that I mentioned earlier, extreme events, flooding, and other sorts of disruptions that are continuing to mobilize that phosphorus that we've already liberated. Um, and this is going to make it very hard, even if we change practices now, um, to see results in the time scale that we would like to see them, that you know, people like to see and that politicians like to see them. So to me, it's sort of like the next 50 years, we may do a lot of great stuff to improve our phosphorus uh, practices, improve the food system, shift away from so much uh, high phosphorus meat consumption, do better with waste, do better with animal waste, all these things we could do a great job in 50 years and it might not matter. Um, and that's gonna be hard to explain. <laughs> um, it might not matter for another century um, before we see a lot of the benefits of that um, come forward because of this, uh, the amount that we've already produced and brought into circulation. That's a real pessimistic yeah. Sorry. Do we know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to add one tidbit to your pessimism, and then I'll let okay. Joanna do the Let's same, and then Joanna do the same, and then we'll, though, yeah. Right? So uh, <laughs> the other thing that we've been seeing, one of the things that we've been concerned about, and, you know, the downstream receiving water bodies, whether it's a lake or a river or an estuary, is that with climate change comes changes to that system that make them more susceptible to the effects of these added nutrients. And I want to say, I, I'm, I'm wondering this year, and Lake Erie's been really strange, we weren't expecting a very large bloom. It is still going. We are in November, and we still have elevated chlorophyll A. And that is unheard of in Lake Erie, but it's been very warm, right? This whole summer, not always, but very often, we've had higher than normal air temperatures, which in fact, water temperature, not, not like North Carolina heat. I am from Virginia, I understand how that can be much warmer than what we see in Ohio, but I think that that's a challenge too. So on top of this other pessimistic view of like potentially increased runoff is you might have a different downstream receiving water body that's receiving that. Um, Jan, did you have a thought about what you think is the largest threat? Well, uh, several things came to mind in that question, and, and one was, look, folks, this is supposed to be easy. The way you, you really go after reducing nutrient pollution is to reduce nutrient pollution. <laughs> it's a no-brainer. What about all the toxic materials that we're spewing into our aquatic ecosystems? Um, 86,000 chemicals that are in our drinking water that the industries don't even have to report. We have to figure out what they are. And so when I teach a course in environmental issues and aquatic ecology, I just keep weaving in and out mentioning toxic materials, which are synergistic at times with nutrient pollution. The way to reduce nutrient pollution and, and its impacts in aquatic ecosystems is to stop adding more nutrients and then give the system some time to recover. Sometimes systems can't recover because we've also added exotic invasive species, but often they can at least improve. Um, if we can't figure out how to do better at controlling nutrient pollution, we can't address some of the extremely challenging issues like all the toxic substance contamination going into our waters. And, and so to me, it just takes it back again simplistically to trying to get our, the people of the, of, of the world, the people of the, each of our countries and our politicians to understand the pressing need from climate change, which is a synergistic effect with nutrients and stimulating harmful algae, as Laura mentioned, mm -hmm. to all kinds of other pollutants that can be synergistic. There's some great research in South Carolina right now that has shown that Microsystem toxins are, being, are, are acting synergistically with nanoparticulate plastics and causing all sorts of health impacts, not just the fish. We really need to do, to be able to, to do much better at squeezing the pipes on this issue and getting folks in agriculture to understand as well. Again, um, I think it goes back in part to economics. In our state, we got cropland farmers convinced to reduce their nitrogen loading, their nitrogen application of fertilizer, 
because they were afraid for generations that they had to add this, the, the same high amount. And they became convinced through lots of good education that no, you can have the same crop for 40% less nitrogen. It's, it's, it's possible to do. It, we, we really need to, to put education and action better here, I think. So I think we're getting close to the end of our time. We have a little bit of time left. I want to give us all, an, unless there's one last question, I want to give us all an opportunity because we did just go down the sad side of things. Is there anything <laughs> optimistic or that you see um, in your work right now in terms of the positive things, things that seem to be working or maybe a little glint of hope in the future? Sure. Well, I mean, I think one thing that makes me optimistic is that there's two really big things that determine how much nutrient, nutrients and fertilizers and other sources of nutrients are determined and, and what happens to them. And, and those, two of those things are very much in control of human action and decision making and therefore can change at the, in the short term. And those are, in the shorter term at least, one of those is food waste. So 30, 40% of food is wasted globally. So I think we know how to, to we know sort of where it's happening. It's not crazy innovation or new physics or stuff that needs to be invented to solve food waste problems. It's supply chain issues. It's human decision making. It's food labeling. It's things like that. So if we're able to address food waste, um, we can take a big chunk out of how much food we need to produce and therefore how much nutrients we put, have to put down. So that one, I think, is something that I think could have impact quite uh, uh, pretty reasonably. Another one is diet and how much uh, meat that we consume and how, which forms of meat that we consume will have a real impact on nutrient management because we have to, so much of our fertilizer is used to grow um, crops for uh, feeding cows, pigs, and other uh, animals. And so if we're able to, um, humanely, productively, positively, constructively start to shift our diet away from meat, away from phosphorus intensive meat, which is especially beef and cattle, um, and towards the lower end of the phosphorus footprint side of the scale, um, we will have very rapid impact on how much um, uh, phosphorus is needed and nitrogen is needed to drive the food system. So those two things I think can happen pretty quickly um, and can happen if charismatic leaders arise in the field of the food water system to convince people and to make people see the, the benefits of, of, doing, um, of doing that. Joanne, do you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I look at, at these kinds of extreme challenges like we're talking about, and I'd almost like to advocate for going for the low hanging fruit, which in my opinion is to repeat in, in a better sense, what Jim was talking about in, in his um, having said, having shown us that prior to 2000, there was great success in reducing phosphorus and nitrogen in sewage. It's low hanging fruit still in this nation. Why is it that our waters are now being degraded from more raw sewage? So and why we, can't we take the same approach with human waste? that we took with human waste for animal waste. How is it possible <laughs> that massive amounts of manure are released to the environment without treatment? It's just quite staggering, actually, to me, to think about. It, those are, that's another great point. <laughs> Sewage um, treatment is squeezing the pipes. I don't know how many courses I've taken in my life as an undergraduate where, where I was told that squeezing the pipes was really easy. It's not in point, that's a problem. Let's at least go for the low-hanging fruit and uh, do better on sewage treatment. There have been successes, as I mentioned, in BNR. We just need a, an influx of funding from our governments to do better and for cities who want to do better to do better. Jim's point about manu the manure issue, I, I think we, we really need to work on convincing animal, industrialized animal agriculture that remove that recovering phosphorus and nitrogen from their manure can be profitable, and then we would have much better success. So hopefully we can do both. Um, 
Yeah, so um, so for my optimistic side, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna do this place-based again because that's what I think about a lot, but I have, I have a couple of very nice stories. One of them is in, in Lake Erie, in the Western Lake Erie Basin, you know, we saw increases in dissolved phosphorus, but before then we saw decreases. And there was a period, a sweet spot in the 90s, where Lake Erie was the poster child of ecosystem, you know, restoration and recovery. Um, and while I know we're growing more things now, we're much more smart about it than we used to be. So I like to think that if we've done it in the past, we can get back to that and do that again. It's much more difficult when we haven't done something before to see the future that we could get there again. So I like to look to that. But the other thing is that we do have another watershed that we have been monitoring. It's Grand Lake St. Mary's. is Ohio's largest inland reservoir. It was the second highest in chlorophyll A and microcystin concentrations in like the 2009 National Lakes Assessment. Um, so it has some serious problems. But with a lot of good work, they've got 90% of the farmers in that watershed that's mostly uh, confined animal feeding operations taking, transporting manure out of the watershed and putting it into fields that can actually take it. They are doing things like the cover crops and better nutrient management. Um, I think 99% of the cropland has some sort of a nutrient management plan. And while the levels of nutrients coming from these watersheds are still way too high, we're actually starting to see decreases, which is crazy. Nitrate was on average for a whole year, like 16 milligrams per liter of nitrogen. And now it's gone down to averaging more like closer to the drinking water limit, which is 10. Um, there's also other things that seem promising. Wetlands sometimes seem like a toss up when it comes to phosphorus. They can become sources if they're not well managed. They're doing it in Grand Lake and it's working um, as an additional thing to help. And so I like to look at things like these. They're hard, but it can be done if you have a really good group of people that are invested and interested in that community and trying to improve those aquatic ecosystems. So, we just need more, more excitable people. So um, with that, I think that we're coming up on our coffee break and you guys might be done with hearing us jabber. Um, I'm guessing that you guys are tired of jabbering. I wanna thank you all for being here and listening to us talk about these issues. I'm sure if you have any follow-up questions or thoughts to share with us, we're gonna be here. Um, at least Gemini will be here we're all, all week. week. Yep, we're here all week for you. So uh, please be, come and, and chat with any of us. Thank you all. Thank you.